a loaf of bread, a, a synth glass food container, a bag of frozen broccoli, and a two pack of toothpaste. She already put back the box of green tea, a luxury she knows she can't afford, but sometimes it's nice to carry it around for a while. Lucky for her, Ginger lets her drink the cold coffee left over in the pot each morning when she arrives. She pours it into a mug, zaps it for 45 seconds, and chugs it before hand cleaning all the breakfast dishes, despite the happy home dishwasher. After buying the whole chicken from the Market Plus in the inner ring, riding all the way home with the thawing bird freezing her lap on the bus, she is left with just five clicks. Bargain Bucks sells everything for a single click, but Sharon knows that after tax, each item costs a click 19, meaning she has enough to get four things to survive her until Saturday. She needs the synth glass container for the chicken, which will feed her all week. The last one broke. The bread makes toast for breakfast and will fill her up. The toothpaste is non-negotiable. She could go without vegetables as most people in the outer ring do, but she loves them, craves them, and wants to stay as healthy as possible. Broccoli wins out. Sharon leaves the shampoo back in the toiletries aisle where it belongs. She'll skip washing her hair tomorrow, then use up the rest of what she has on Tuesday morning. Maybe some liquid dish soap will do the trick the rest of the week. She wears her hair up in an effort to keep it out of the messes and cleaning products. If she doesn't break much of a sweat, maybe her hair won't smell too bad. She should probably cut it. That would lower shampoo costs and would involve shorter showers. The water bill would go down, maybe. Did you get a great deal of bargain bucks today? A clerk says as he stares downward, watching her slide the items over the beeping scanner. No one is at any of the other checkout stations he monitors. Yes, thank you, Sharon says, smiling faintly, searching for eye contact. How's your day? Happiness and luck with bargain buck. Sharon cringes, forgetting that this is the required response for all employees. The man must be about her age, maybe 25 or 26. His name tag reads Jeff. She knows if she asks about the third F that he'll have to claim it's the real spelling, that his employer couldn't possibly have made a mistake. Otherwise, she guesses they would charge him for a new name tag. Why bother? Even though Jeff doesn't stand very tall, he bends at the upper back and neck, obviously bad posture, posture even in, in his tan smock. He wears his hair in dreadlocks that fall halfway down his back, pulled together by a synth leather string. Sharon tries to imagine her sleek jet black hair the same way. Would that even work? It would take care of the shampoo problem, but no one in the inner ring would hire her if she looked like that. Though it would be hilarious to imagine Ginger confronting her about it. She'd need Harold to do it. She shines her comm at the reader to pay. Would you like to sign up for the Bargain Buckaroo Credit Club today? Jeff says, scanning her receipt to make sure she doesn't steal anything. No, thank you. You could be approved immediately and save up to 5% on all future purchases. Thank you, but no. Can I get a bag, please? I didn't see any at the checkout station. 25 bits. I've never had to pay for a bag before, Sharon says. New policy. Still dead-eyed and lacking intonation in his voice. One bit short. She can't afford a one-use bag, let alone an emergency by the end of the week. How will she save enough for a business license? How will she and Lala ever open their own salon and barbershop? Sharon wants to run the business, do the books. Lala will be the lead hairstylist. We'll hire a few people, train them, treat them right, put in tons of hours themselves until they get a few customers. Not like how Happy Helpers pays her the hourly minimum, less expenses. But she has to save. Property rent, business license, costs to get started. Her salon will be nice, clean, classy, but not pricey for the people of the outer ring. Never mind. Sharon crams the toothpaste in her beaten up shoulder bag, unable to zip it shut now. She puts the bag of broccoli in the synth glass container and carries it in one hand, the bread in the other. Thank you, Jeff. Can I help anyone else? He responds. There is no one waiting. Thank you. Wonderful, thanks, Meg. One of the things, one of the many things that's been unique about this group of writers uh, is that for the first time in my five years of teaching this class, there was 100% completion by the, 100% completion of finished novels by the group. Um, uh, another testament to the terrific work that they, um, did this year and encourage each other to do this year. 
Uh, our next reader is Tarek Samad. Every workshop has its skeptic, and Tarek was ours. It's a skepticism he uses to great effect in his novel, After All You've Said and Written, an expansive and roaming manuscript about the limits of our wisdom and the very nature of our being. That's a grandiose description, to be sure, but it's also a fitting one. In these pages, the author asks more questions than he answers. He visits the four corners of time and space, and yet still manages an intimate story about one, contemplative's man, one contemplative man's search to make meaning of it all. In the hands of a lesser mind, a book like this might be difficult to bear, but in Tarek's, it's an enlightening pleasure, as he was a pleasure each week. Welcome, Tarek. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, and I want to say really that this class has been a, a phenomenal once in a lifetime experience and um, your encouragement and guidance have been instrumental in getting me to where I am with, with this work and uh, the cohort has been phenomenal too. So thank you, Peter, Anna, Cheryl, Meg, Megan and Tom. Well, a few words about my novel and I think I'm going to say a few more words than the others have said so far about theirs. Uh, it's an experimental work with autofictional and metafictional elements laced throughout. There is one sustained character, the narrator, a man whose initials appear in the title of the book. He refers to himself in the second person, so he's writing and talking to himself about his life and work and relationships and reflections. The novel is structured as a series of chapters that are very different in style and substance. A few chapters are research papers on topics related to control systems, artificial intelligence, and consciousness. In a couple of chapters, and these sort of bookend the book, the narrator and his wife are driving back from an evening out. Some chapters have him imagining people in the past and the future living and dying. A cat catastrophe makes his presence felt here and there. A few chapters consist of nothing but verbatim quotations from people who don't appear elsewhere. The narrator also recalls some relationships he's had with women. There's a discussion of climate change towards the end. And the final chapter includes a number of letters written as if in an advice column. The style of the book is diverse too. Stream of consciousness and narrative prose are interwoven. Numerous sections are written without punctuation. In other places, equations, figures, photographs, PowerPoint slides, and even a carton strip are included. There are, however, several thematic elements and topical threads. These relate to the worldview that the narrator is espousing, as well as various other things that I hope bring cohesion and unity to the novel. I will be reading the first chapter of the novel, which is actually chapter zero. So after all is said and written by AA chapter zero. It's dark outside early on a dead of winter's evening in Minneapolis. You're ensconced in a favorite bar, unbusy at this hour, Notebook open to a page that was blank a half hour earlier. Electronic votive candles borrowed from adjacent tables supplement the dim interior lighting, allowing you to respond to the question you're asking yourself. Now that your book is written, how should it start? You've come full circle. You've closed the loop after a half dozen years. A sense of closure nonetheless evades you. You want to say that your book, this book, is about humanity and life, about love and death, about how people think and how they talk, about knowledge and belief and coming to grips with uncertainty, about consciousness and control systems and the interconnections, about the primacy of rationality and the acknowledgement of its limits, about the existential threat of climate change and the distraction of the COVID-19 pandemic, about how the world is what it is and how people are who they are. Or is the book all and only about yourself? You're recounting your experiences, presenting the concepts and results of your research projects, transcribing what you've heard from friends and overheard from strangers, letting your imagination roam with people you know and others you invent, offering your resolutions to the conundrums of life or second guessing your theories and resolutions. Isn't that all a product of your mind, an elaborate exercise in solipsism? How could it be otherwise? You've been on a search for self sense making, for understanding the world, understanding the people around you, understanding yourself, understanding your cats for that matter. It's lasted most of your life, the pieces of the jigsaw starting to fall into place some years ago. And now, if you sometimes feel you've solved the puzzle, at least to your occasional satisfaction, you also know that the answers beg the questions that led to them, for they assert in part that some questions are inherently unanswerable 
and that all answers are inevitably uncertain. You've wondered whether these epistemological complications undermined your project, whether they showed that the edifice you've constructed is built on a foundation unable to support its weight. But truths that are qualified by uncertainty and probability are still truths, albeit of a different order, more complex, more abstract, but not vitiated. You learn things you didn't know, and you're still convinced you have something to tell the world that the world doesn't know. In bars and cafes, airports and airplanes, hotel rooms and at home, it's your mood and your surroundings that have been your muse. Perhaps that's what this book is too, a set of inspirations of the moment, if guided by contemplations sustained over decades. You followed your instincts in how to write your words, your sentences, your paragraphs, your chapters, just as much as in what to write about. That is, you've accepted, even pursued, heterogeneity in both form and content. It seems organic and integrated whole to you, not the scattershot fragmented product it might appear at first inspection to others, but you are not an unbiased reader. Hiroshima, Harbin, China, Paris, Istanbul, Islamabad, Pakistan, Buenos Aires, Minneapolis and elsewhere in the US, life and work have brought you to many places around the globe. What you've seen and heard, the people you've affected and who've affected you, the experiences that have informed or confirmed your mental models of the world and its inhabitants. It's all to be found on the following pages, a journal and more of six years and longer. At certain times, and you've noticed they're often coincident with your second martini, gin, dry, twist, and you spy it being carried to your table now. It's a sense of melancholy that suffuses your consciousness. You wonder then about the point or pointlessness of your cogitation and of your insistent rationality. You wonder too at all that you forfeited in service of whatever knowledge and meta-knowledge you've gained. At some point you realized you think differently than anyone you know. It was a short step from there to believing that you think differently from anyone on the planet. If this book is unlike anything you've read, could it be unlike anything anyone else has read too? Who are you, the happiest man in the world, the most content, the most reconciled, the most indifferent and resigned? Are you all of the above simultaneously? And what will happen after the book is published? Your life will be altered, disrupted. Your wife, your erstwhile lovers, your friends, your mother, your colleagues, everyone who knows you will realize you're not the person they were sure you were. But you've lived a lie for too long, or you've lived the truth unheralded for long enough. It started six years ago, the evening after the dinner outing with a couple you and your wife know. That's when you wrote the first draft of the first chapter, which brings you to the here and now, to the end of the zeroth or last increment, an afterthought and a foreword. Thank you. Thank you, Tarek. One of the things that's been such a uh, terrific, uh, and as I've already sort of alluded to, unique experience is the diversity of stories that we've read this year, and you're already getting, an, <clears throat> excuse me, getting a sense of that from just three readers. Uh, we're going to change the tune and tone again with our next reader, Tom Sabank. The two boys at the center of his novel, Wish I Weren't Here, are as indelible as the southeastern landscape he sets them in. Will, the protagonist, is stolen away by his father and brought to what at first seems an idyllic vacation spot. But it's not long before he realizes that something's amiss, and with the help of his newfound friend, he plots his escape home. What ensues is more than an epic chase. It's a tragic coming of age story, an extraordinary look into the broken home, into a broken home and an equally broken boy. And most importantly, a portrait of courage and perseverance. On top of all that, it's tautly written and expertly paced. And I would happily read a thousand more pages of Tom's book. Tom? Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you uh, for the class uh, and your guidance and your patience and for keeping us all on track. I know that wasn't easy in most classes, but you did it. Um, class was, was even better than I had hoped it would be. Um, and so thank you for finally helping me, uh, helping me finally finish my first novel. Uh, thanks to my cohort, Cheryl, Anna, Tariq, Meg, and Megan. Um, just such an amazing group. You know, I was amazed. There was no overlap in style or genre or 
pretty much anything about our books. They're all so different, wildly different and unique. And uh, all your stories are so wonderful. Um, but you approached each project, no matter how different it was from yours, thoughtfully and honestly, and, and gave wonderful insights. So I couldn't ask for more. And most importantly, I want to thank my family, uh, who I believe is watching. Um, this was such a serious investment in time and money. Uh, my wife, Joanne, has been so incredibly supportive the whole way. Uh, even reading my first draft with probably over a billion typos in it, um, as the group well knows. And uh, and thanks to my sons, Truman, Miles, and Marshall, who had to deal with me being holed up in the office writing night after night. You guys are awesome. So my novel is a, is a book for middle grade children. It's called Wish I Weren't Here. Um, it's a story of a 12-year-old boy, Clay, who goes on an impromptu vacation to North Carolina with his estranged dad. But as the trip unfolds, things don't seem right. He isn't allowed to contact his mom and his dad's mental state seems to be deteriorating. Clay begins to realize that he's been kidnapped by his father. And with the help of a mysterious kid he meets in North Carolina, he has to figure out how to escape and make his way home to Wisconsin. Um, I'm gonna read the first scene of the book. It's called, We Made It. The Seaview Motel had no view of the sea. Perhaps when it had been built, when it had been named, each room enjoyed an unrestricted view of the dunes and the never ending waves. Perhaps also when the Seaview was built, its cinder block base wasn't cracked and crumbling and stained with salt water. But time has a way of changing things. By now, a condominium building, at least 10 stories high, had been built between the old Seaview Motel and the beach, keeping that precious ocean view hostage. And the very foundation of the motel was midway through its long, gradual slide into decay. A faded blue Toyota Corolla pulled off the highway and onto the gravel service road that led to the motel parking lot, punctuating the air with pops from the bits of gravel that cracked and split under the weight of four nearly ball tires. As the car pulled into the parking lot, each bump caused the suspension to moan, but in the passenger seat, Clay bristled with excitement. He peered out the window, craning his neck, eyes darting, hoping for a glimpse of the water. His entire 12 year old frame was compressed, ready to shoot out of the car the moment it came to a stop. They pulled into a parking spot just below the buzzing vacancy sign. This is it, his father smiled as he jerked the shifter into park and the car lurched to a halt. Clay yanked the door handle and heaves his shoulder against the stubborn car door to shove it open. The rusted door opened with a creak and Clay stood up, escaping into the fresh air to face the North Carolina sun. His calf muscles were stiff from idleness. They had, been, they had driven straight through the night, stopping only to pee and eat cheap hamburgers. Even when they stopped in town to get a few groceries and a styrofoam boogie board, Clay's dad made it clear he should stay in the car. But now, free to move, the pain was worth it. Ever since the moment his father surprised Clay with this last minute vacation to North Carolina, Clay had imagined this moment, seeing the waves, the seagulls, the sand for the first time. It looked much different than he had imagined, of course, like everything does when you see it in all its naked realness. The paint peeling off the motel, the loose trash and the grassy dunes, but mostly what Clay had neglected to take into account was the smell of the ocean. It was completely alien to him. The air in Wisconsin never dripped, with the smell of salt and fish and sand. But that smell was all the invitation he needed. His aching legs sprung into action and he ran past the condos and straight onto the first dune he found. He wore jeans and his shoes were not built for sand, but he plowed ahead nonetheless until he was on top of a mound of sand as large as a bus. There he took in the full scale of the ocean set out in front of him. This, this was what he imagined. The flat sand stretching out into the water the water a deep ancient blue rising and lowering, waves curling and falling to meet the sand with a sound that was both a crash and a sigh. Michael, his father shouted. Clay cringed, that name, Michael. Sure, it was his actual name, but these days it felt as alien to him as the salty air. After his parents split up a few months ago, he decided to go by the name Clay instead. It seemed to suit him better. His mother was happy to go along with the change, but Clay still hadn't told his father about the new preference. He didn't know if he ever would. Yeah, Clay shouted back, letting the wind carry his voice while his eyes stayed glued to the waves. Help carrying these groceries, 
and we can check out the, and then we can check out the beach, said his father, getting out of the car and stretching his back. Clay's shoulders slumped a little. He let his eyes and ears and skin take it in for just a half moment longer before he turned to do as his dad said. That wind had been carrying that sulky air through the tall grass on that dune forever. It had waited lifetimes for him. It would have to wait a few minutes more because he didn't dare ruin his dad's good mood. Thank you, Tom. It's interesting to hear Tom and Terry read one after the next and hear the differences in style and the differences in tone. Um, and those differences, I think, were one of the main reasons, not just the differences between the two of them, but the differences between all of them, that the group was such a, a unique and successful workshop. We learned so much from each other, I think. I know I did from, from the different styles and the different voices and the different um, tempos that we stole, told our stories in. So, uh, And now for another change of pace. Whenever a book combines a rapping Edgar Allan Poe, a sulking H.P. Lovecraft, the ghosts of mobsters and politicians past, a pulpy reality TV show, unhappy homecomings, broken friendships, sex, and a murder, you've got my attention. This is just some of the witches brew E.O. Farrow concocts in her massively inventive novel, Providence Murder Ballad. When her best laid plans to return home and murder her double-crossing best friend from high school go sideways, Tina, the book's villain and heroine, finds herself wandering the streets of her hometown of Providence. Over the course of one fateful night, she must come to terms with countless ghosts, both the literal and the metaphorical kind, and decide whether to reconcile with her former best friend or leave her for dead. In a, no in a novel that never stops asking tough questions in a voice that never stops surprising, E.A. Farrow has written one of the most inventive novels of the year, one that's impossible to forget. You're on the stage, ma'am. Thank you so much. So writing is really solitary and I just have so much gratitude to Peter and The Loft, Jenny and all of the other writers in this group for being such an amazing and compelling community. Um, and it's just been fantastic. I'm gonna read to you from the first chapter so you don't need any background. And I thought I'd just use this time to tell you a little bit about how I started writing this book. So I grew up in Providence, Rhode Island. I lived there till I was about 23 and I've mostly lived in Minnesota since then. So I've been here like 15, 20 years. And even now, most of my dreams take place in Providence. And people, events, things that happen in Minnesota, they just get reset in Providence in my dreams. And this totally bothers me. I'm completely self-conscious about it. It's like I'm haunted by the city. And that seems like a really good reason to write about something. Like maybe I can shake it loose or something. Um, so Providence is an old city, city, it's built on seven hills. It was made for horses and buggies. It is totally haunted. Um, I grew up just thinking it was normal. That was what I knew. I grew up drinking from a fountain in front of the library that had been cursed by H.P. Lovecraft. I walked by the laundromat that was the front for the New England mob. I learned to ride my bike in the cemetery by H.P. Lovecraft's grave. So um, that's a little bit of where this came from. So I'm gonna start chapter one, Providence Murder Ballad. Tina planned my murder with her usual attention to detail. She knew it would be her downfall, but ever the perfectionist, she'd get it right. Murdering her best friend would be no different than anything else she did. She was always so sure of herself, even before she abandoned me and took up her goody two shoes, hotshot lawyer persona, Back when we cut shirts so they fell off our shoulders, climbed over walls to smoke weed in grassy fields, called WBRU in the middle of the night to dedicate songs to crushes, she wrote out strategies like they were battlefield plans. She set the rules. I was happy to follow. I'd go anywhere with her, at least until she became someone else. I asked for an explanation. How could you murder your best friend? I would have been happy with a couple sentences expressing regret. But I was asking Tina, 
And I got a Tina response, always the overachiever. She made me a postmortem mixtape, not just a cassette with songs recorded off the radio, but an operatic retelling of those 24 hours before my death, all our favorites from high school. People who say they don't want to have, people who say they don't want attention have a way of taking center stage. We meet in her house at night and she recounts the next part of the story. We go song by song in the mixtape. I get it now. You only see into the crevasses of someone's personality when they're forced to the edge. I don't just mean Tina. I'm also talking about myself. She says, I took her joy. What joy? I took the nightmares that had plagued her since we were 16 and turned them to gold. A hit TV series on Holler Plush, ghoulish nightmares landed me on the red carpet, the cover of Vogue. I tried to share, but she was all venom, refused to be my date for the Emmys, never even acknowledged I was taking her mom for chemo treatments. And if a TV show can ruin your marriage, was it worth saving? This is how the events leading up to my death began. It was a summer solstice the night Tina came home. I was at my downtown condo in pink pajamas with cucumbers over my eyes. We had plans to meet the next morning, but I hope we'd at least talk that night. My dad had a concert at the community college next day and I figured I'd go if Tina came with me. I was looking forward to what I thought would be Tina and Mai's reconciliation. I should have known better. A cab dropped Tina in front of her mom's house just off Hope Street. She stood with her suitcase on the sidewalk. A dim light shone in the depth of the house. Shadows covered the bright red door and filled the wild mane of the lion knocker. Her mom hadn't left the porch light on. Standing tall, shoulders back, Tina walked past a crumbling retaining wall. She took the steps with a quick efficiency, only to sit down on the metal box where milk was delivered Friday mornings. After a few breaths, she stood again. The smell of wisteria scratched at the back of her throat, and she imagined the vines clawing into the rusted window screens above, growing through the loose window frames to dangle vines into her house. Hand to doorknob, palms slippery in the heat, she tightened her grip. No give. She was locked out. Thinking her mom had left the key under the back porch, Tina walked around the house through the dark yard. She squatted by where her mother usually threw a key under the stairs. Balanced on toes to protect her fitted white capris, Tina groped in the moist duff of dirt and leaves. No key. A movement at the corner of her eye made her whip around to look at the stretch of grass and stand of hemlocks. A rabbit? Feeling eyes on her, Tina held her breath. A rough, rough wet tongue licked her. She yelped, lost her balance, and fell onto hands and knees. Red eyes hovered in the dark. A small fluffy white kitten rubbed against her bare leg. Her mom had told her about an intense Ouija board session that sent the message, my cat will watch over you. The next day, her mom had found a small white kitten on the porch. She fed it, brushed its tangled fur, and let it in, but the cat never got bigger and never settled. Tina had rolled her eyes when her mom told her the Ouija board pronounced its name was Kitty. How profound. When Kitty came into the house, all she wanted to do was race down into the basement. Even Tina's childhood dog refused to go down there. We refused to go down there. The basement made the skin crawl on animals of all species. Kitty, Tina whispered, reaching out to pat the soft fur. You stink. The cat smelled of sulfur and dirt. Mom feed you people food? Tina scratched behind its ears and the cat pressed its soft cotton against her calves. Oh, sweet kitty, forgotten and alone in the night. Sharp teeth in her hand made her cry out. The cat seemed to evaporate as soon as it drew blood. Tina looked around expecting to be attacked again. She pressed the wound to her mouth, remembering how her mom had brought out the Ouija board to figure out how to handle the media calls. Should she take sides? And if so, with her daughter or with me? Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thanks, yay. I've um, I've talked a lot tonight, or at least some, about the different stories that the group is writing and the adversity that we've overcome and the resilience that they've shown. But I think the most notable uh, thing about this group, after all, is the friendships that seem so genuine and certainly the connection that I feel like I've made with everyone and have watched the group make. And for all the reasons that we come together in these classes to write these books, that seems like as good a reason as any. And I just want each of you to know, Cheryl and Meg and Tarek and Tom and Anna and Megan, 
what a pleasure it's been to be your teacher this year. You've said so many kind things about the class. Well, the class is the result of your terrific work and your terrific dedication to each other. Um, and I've learned as much from you as I've taught you, I can assure you of that. So I wanted to squeeze that in before we got to the end of the night. Um, our, our last reader is Megan, Megan Kathleen Smith. And when I first heard her describe what she had in mind for this novel, I remember very distinctly thinking that she better be able to write and write really well in order to pull it off. From the first word in Wearing the Black, her novel, she dazzles. Set in Gilded Age, New York, a brilliant young woman who's trained in but not allowed to practice law, finds herself suddenly in the favor of perhaps the least likely person, the dashing, annoying Mr. Ryan, her dead father's successor at the family law firm. What ensues is equal parts period piece, whodunit, social commentary, and saucy love story. Taken all together, the effect is simply dazzling. Megan writes with a clarity and flair that's only matched by her attention to detail. Here's another book, impossible to shake, but then again, why would you want to? Thank you for that, Peter. Um, and thank you more for your leadership this past year. You have truly helped me refine both my craft and my vision for this book. And I couldn't be more grateful. Um, I am also incredibly grateful for the fact that of the gifts this class has given me, um, my cohort is really high on that list. Um, I, you guys have set the bar so high as artists, as companions, as uh, critique partners. And I am just excited to read your books in full and thrilled to go into this next chapter in our writing careers together. Um, I am going to go ahead and start at the very beginning of my novel. As Peter said, it's set in Gilded Age or late 19th century New York. Epigraph. It is sometimes better to be a dead man than a live woman. Matilda Gage. I'm not sure what I would have done had Frederica Albright not come to call. My father's death had left me short of funds and without meaningful work of my own. Boredom conspired with necessity, driving me to consider dreadful measures such as matrimony or even novel writing. I first learned of Mrs. Albright's need for my peculiar brand of legal aid at Uncle Andrew's house, where I'd come for Sunday dinner. I waited on the stoop and ducked my chin into my collar. The dark evening made me grateful that he'd sent his coach to carry me the few blocks from my row house in Greenwich Village to Gramercy Park. Miss Carey, the housekeeper frowned as she opened the door to the brownstone. You've been starving yourself again. I have not. Self-conscious, I ran my hands down the queerest bodice of my dress. I had mourned the bustle's resurrection these last few years, clinging to more rational styles. But Uncle Andrew's housekeeper made me long for a fabric fortress, a garrison of petticoat troops with a bustle captain. Not for the first time, I wished that Sunday weren't the butler's half day. The man's discreet disapproval was easier to endure than the housekeeper's well-meaning concern. Allow yourself to waste away and you will break his heart. If you will not take care of yourself for your own sake, she trailed off. Despite these exaggerations, I was perfectly well. It's true that in the aftermath of my father's death, I'd experienced some difficulty with food. The situation had gone bad enough that loved ones took turns sitting me at the table and staring me into each bite, indifferent to the way it turned to ash in my mouth. I was healthy now, simply angular, sharp-faced and skinny, if one were unnecessarily honest. The housekeeper's natural roundness led her to equate weight with health. I suspected her and the cook of feeding Uncle Andrew into the gout that plagued him, and I intervened in his diet where I could. She shooed me into the parlor, confiding, that nice Mr. Ryan is here. My feet stuttered on the threshold of the double parlor. 
Indeed, two men occupy the far chamber. One was Uncle Andrew, stroking his sideburns as he considered some point of his colleagues. The other was the devil in the flesh. I might as well admit it was attractive flesh. Christopher Ryan's coloring is ordinary, all shades of tan and brown, but his face has the symmetry of classical sculpture. He has one small scar, an arc that bisects his right eyebrow and saves him from marble perfection. His height and athleticism also help Mr. Ryan to stand out from the crowd. If they manage not to puff, most people seem to wear, sagging and fraying like old pillows. You're sure you won't stay, Uncle Andrew pressed? Thank you, but I am otherwise engaged. Mr. Ryan looked up to find me approaching. As much as I hate to deprive Miss Carrie of the pleasure of my company. Jacqueline. Uncle Andrew smiled at me before fixing his face into a scolding expression. I don't know why the two of you refuse to get along. Rarely have I seen otherwise amiable individuals so determined to bring out the worst in one another. I'm afraid Mr. Ryan finds me shrewish, I said icily, seating myself on the giltwood settee as far from his chair as I could manage. And Miss Carey objects to both my intelligence and my breeding. Nonsense. Jacqueline is too discerning for that, and not at all high in the insta, Uncle Andrew protested. He said nothing to refute the accusation of shrewishness, and Mr. Ryan's lips twitched as he, too, noticed the oversight. His housekeeper must have caught Uncle Andrew's eye because he nodded at her and rose. With a casual air that deceived no one, he observed, You know, Chris, I can think of no individual better suited for the particular duties of a lawyer's wife. Neither Mr. Ryan's nor my reaction to this suggestion did us credit, and so I will admit them. Just wonderful, Megan, thank you. Hello, my name is Peter Guy. I'm the loft teaching artist for the year-long novel writing program. I'm here today to introduce in a re-recorded version uh, one of our 2021 students, Cheryl Bailey. Each year, one student distinguishes herself for the leaps and bounds she makes in this program. Cheryl Bailey is that person from 2021. A retired surgeon who brings her laser focus and humor and empathy to Nay Riley, a novel that spans the final two years in the education of an oncology fellow at an Appalachian University. This novel dissects a process that's equally exhausting and rewarding, and it does so with style and wit. Full of unforgettable characters, both the sick and the healing kind, and a protagonist as determined as the disease she treats. Welcome to the Zoom stage, Cheryl Bailey. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for the introduction and for your encouragement and class structure over the year. Um, I don't even miss my robust, exciting, and beefy adjectives. And my writing is all the better for your guidance. You just had a wonderful combination of obviously needed uh, encouragement and editing, but you always encouraged us in an honest way and made us feel like we were we were working for a, a, a good path and that we were gonna finish our novels. And we did, so thank you. Um, as you heard, my novel, Nay Riley, A Patient Love Story, is about a young surgeon in training named Shelley Riley in a university in Kentucky in the mid 1990s. And Shelley is getting crushed during the two years of fellowship from chauvinistic bosses, from a north south kind of thing, from some religious differences, etc. But she loves her patients, and they are a big part of the book. The passage I'm about to read introduces a woman named Faye Colgate. Uh, she is a patient who appears many times in the novel, and we'll be meeting her in the clinic the day before her big, kind of scary cancer surgery, along with her elderly mom, Sissy, and her dear friend, Carrie. The salvation Shelley needed to keep from falling apart came at a most desperate time in her fellowship, in the form of the remarkable Faye Colgate. Faye arrived for the one o'clock Monday appointment in Dr. Kerfleet's clinic, knowing something was amiss in her abdomen and that she'd need surgery. She'd driven over from her little town of Red Rock Falls, just south of Bowling Green, Kentucky, 
where she owned and ran a dress shop. She and her mom listened carefully to the consultation while her friend Carrie took detailed notes, occasionally getting clarification on a point and jotting it down. I'm healthy as a horse, Dr. Kerfleet, Faye told them. I want you to remember that when y'all are working on me tomorrow. Take out everything I don't need, y'all, because I don't particularly want another crack at this surgery thing. Oh, and the folks at home would love to have a look at my appendix or my gallbladder. If you could send me home with a little souvenir, I'd appreciate it. The group chuckled as they opened the exam room door, Carrie shaking her head. I'll need to tell everyone back home, Carrie told Shelley in the hallway as Faye was getting ready to disrobe for her exam. Faye acts like this is just a little nip and tuck, doctor, but I'm hearing you say it's quite a big surgery. They could both hear laughter in the exam room as Faye and Nurse Donna were going on about something. Faye's mom, Sissy, nodded and added, "'Twouldn't be Faye now without the laughing, would it, Carrie? I believe she'll be laughing while y'all are operating on her tomorrow, Dr. Riley." Sissy's voice was light, but tears bulged in the older woman's eyes. Shelley knew Faye was 45 years old, never married, no kids, and lived with her mom. Sissy looked to be in her 80s, and while Shelley was trying to figure out her age, Sissy seemed to read her mind. She's my only child, and I had her right late in life, you know. I never could get pregnant, Dr. Riley. My husband Gabriel and I were married for 18 years, and my monthly came just like clockwork. I'd cry sometimes at the sight of it. Well, we took to Jesus for comfort figuring out he had a plan and he just didn't mean for us to be parents. Carrie put her arm around the tiny woman, evidently having heard the story before and knowing it was hard for Sissy to tell it. Well, one day I woke up real tender in my belly, and it looked swollen, you see, and right hard. I told my husband, I believe I have a tumor, Gabe. And by now you know, it wasn't a tumor, it was fake. Sissy's face glowed, triumphant in the memory, and Carrie smiled with her, pure delight in knowing her beloved friend had this dream of a mother. Shelley laughed with Sissy. The tumor was Faye. What a story, Sissy. I don't think I'll ever forget it. She ushered them to the lobby and went back to examine Faye Colgate with Dr. Kerfleet. Faye had a lively wit and managed to ask them, feet in stirrups, if she should have her friends bring the team of doctors anything to eat after her surgery the following day. They're great cooks, doctor. They'd be pleased to do it, she offered. She chattered during most of the uncomfortable part of the exam, hiding a grimace with an exhale, saying, Y'all know just where to push now, don't you? The exam finished. Dr. Kerfleet asked, Did she just really offer to cater lunch on the day of her operation, Dr. Riley? He appeared to relish the clinical interaction with Faye Colgate and was more warm and forthcoming than Shelley had ever seen. I'm honored by that offer, ma'am, he said, smiling while he washed his hands. But we'll be fine. Go ahead now and get dressed. Dr. Riley will come back and go over all the details so that everything goes perfectly tomorrow. Pointing to his heart, he added, I'm going to make sure of that. Shelley raised her eyebrows at her boss's enthusiasm. Faye had a bad cancer memorably bad, and her surgery took hours. The doctors worked companionably, counting on her youth and good health for Faye to recover from such a radical, extensive operation. The tumor was scattered throughout her abdomen and ranged from grains of sand to golf, golf ball-sized masses. It was everywhere. Resecting all the cancer required loops of intestine to be removed, belly fat to be released from attachments to healthy surfaces, and hours of inspecting each step to avoid damage. Still, even with top-notch surgery followed by chemotherapy, she would eventually die from this cancer. Shelley, holding the loops of bowel in her hands that day, knew Faye's future. It broke her heart. As Jenny mentioned at the top of the program, um, if anyone, uh, and, it, and it may be hard with this, with this large of a group, but if anyone has any questions or observations they'd like to shout out, we can go ahead and do that. Um, either by voice or in the in the in the comments. I noticed a lot of people with familiar names. I presume that was family uh, for for some of you. 
Um, really, really nice of you all to, to join the group. And it's been really nice to see all of the encouraging comments in the in the chat function as well. Readers, you did just a magnificent job. It's hard to believe that this, uh, I guess, brings to a close uh, officially our time together as a group. Um, but I'm sure that it won't be the last time we'll see each other uh, either individually or, or as a group. You've been one of the most memorable groups that I've had and I'm really um, delighted to see how far you've all come to finish reading your books um, and to see where the future takes you. You've all got terrifically bright futures. So let's give them another uh, air clap again. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone for coming. Jenny, thank you for hosting. And uh, I hope everyone has a great night. And we'll see you again next year at this time. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Good night. Thank yeah. you. Good night. Wonderful Thank readings. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, for, Good night. Thank you for letting the rest of us listen to. I, I, th I thought I was just going to listen to one book, but I heard all of them and they were just fabulous and and just thank you all for your all, all your hard work and for the for mm -hmm. us being able to get a glimpse of your books thank you what talent we have a lot to look forward to peter well, have fun with your new favorite cohort say that again meg yeah. I hope you have fun with your new favorite cohort. Sure, I will. Thanks, Peg. Well, all the books, they will all be published? Well, we certainly hope so. <laughs> They're amazing. The range, the, the depth, the breadth, uh, they were fascinating. Thank you. I agree. All right, we're going to go ahead and uh, and close the Zoom down. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Good night.